from steak to roller coasters <laughs> and Botox to electric cars. Oh my God, it's so fun! Each week, we showcase the new Irish science behind an aspect of modern life. On tonight's show, we find out 10 things to know about sports performance. Jonathan looks at the scientific developments around concussion. Katrina meets the Irish researchers who are working to improve your golf swing. And I find out how isometric strength testing could help our future athletes. We live in a country that some might call a little sports mad. Four out of five adults have played sport at some point in their lives, and as a country, we play over 60 different sports. In the top 10 are cycling, soccer, and GAA, and of course, rugby. We all know exercise is good for us, but many of our sports are not without their dangers. Luckily, new advances in science and technology are allowing us to repair injury, prevent it from happening, and even improve our general game. One of the areas which has seen a lot of scientific progress is concussion. Concussion essentially is damage to the brain or an injury to the brain or the brain function that is usually caused by a blow, and usually a blunt blow to the head. These things happen in every sport, any sport where there's contact there's potential for a blunt head injury. American football is the one that is associated for sure with uh, with concussion. Rugby, it occurs in Gaelic football and people have seen that in high profile games. It occurs in soccer, Robbie Brady. And it occurs obviously in equestrian sports and anywhere there, where there's a possibility for people to have blunt trauma or blow to the head. So we know what concussion is, but what does it actually feel like? Well, Kieran Kilduff is a centre forward for Dundalk and he knows all about it. Shortly after scoring a penalty in the 2016 FAI Cup semi-final replay, Kieran suffered concussion and was out for several weeks. Um, it was, it was a horrible experience and it wasn't, it wasn't one I'd wish on anyone. The initial feeling was probably a bit of, a bit of shock, I was spaced out, I, I wasn't really, I lost a little bit of memory. I wanted to continue but I had to be taken off, the, the medical team took that out of my hands, which I think was right in hindsight. Being a sports person, you keep trying to come back, um, and I know we have stages of you have to go through stages before returning to play. And I continued to fail a lot of them. Was that scary? Yeah, it was actually one particular session I trained, and I came in afterwards, and I actually forgot I trained. And I went into the medical team afterwards, and I said, "Are we ready to go and do this?" And they kind of looked at me and said, "Are you for real?" So that kind of knocked me back a while as well. The first most important part of the treatment of concussion is to recognise it and then remove the player or patient from the situation where they may have further injury. And then you reassess it and there are a series of questions that you can ask and there's nothing too high tech about them. They would be along the lines of who are you playing, what today is it today and then short term memory, what is the score in the match. Among other symptoms, concussion can cause dizziness and loss of coordination, partially due to inner ear imbalance. I've come to the Beaumont Hospital to find out exactly what inner ear imbalance feels like and find out about the work of Dr. Dara Meldrum from the Royal College of Surgeons, who's working hard to try and treat the condition. If a patient comes in and they're complaining of dizziness, it may be as a result of a problem with the inner ear. So the inner ear is here, it's the sensor, and it's located within the skull, so it can be damaged. This little sensor, which is actually the size of your little fingernail, it can be bashed around within your skull and it can get all sorts of problems. So physiotherapists will typically come in and see, is the vestibular system working? Is it giving the right signal into the brain? If a patient gets into a certain position, do you see them spin and you'll see their eyes moving? Because the function of your inner ear is to keep your eyes steady when your head is moving. Right. So if this isn't working, as you walk, the world will move. And that's obviously very hard to then play a game if, you, yeah. if the world is moving. So we will typically look and see how is the patient balancing, how is the vestibular system working, and we'll give them exercises then to try and rehabilitate that. Dara uses a computerized system called Equitest, developed by NASA, to measure how good your balance is, or if you have an inner ear imbalance, which is so often linked to concussion. The machine tests your balance by measuring how much you sway. 
What's with the colour scheme? I feel like I'm in a Cindy Lauper skirt. It's to give you a confusing visual surround. I'm just going to make put these on. If you start to sway too much, they'll save you. OK. The test consists of various trials, each lasting 20 seconds, during which the walls and floor can move while force plates underneath pick up any changes in pressure from your feet. I found the tests easy enough at first, but as things got more complicated, I got the feeling that maybe I'm not as well balanced as I might have thought. I don't know whether, uh, whether or not the wall is moving or my feet are moving, you know? <laughs> no. OK, so that, if we class that as a fall... OK, and there you go again. Am, you I okay? doing, am I doing... I have a feeling I'm not doing well at this. That's considered a fall. Oh, right, OK. OK, and Falls for somebody good. of your age, I would expect you to be able to manage this, yes. <laughs> Humiliation in this it's series it's never <laughs> ends. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, that's you done. Well done. OK. Where you have problems is in the more difficult tests, OK? When we moved the floor, you moved with it, and your sway was, was quite a lot. The last one I really did find tricky. I mean, yeah, it is tricky. If a patient has balance issues, their physiotherapist will recommend exercises to help them recover. But it can be hard to monitor whether or not the patient does these exercises properly or at all. Dara and her team are developing an app which may change all this. The app targets gaze stabilization and creates an exercise program to be done in the comfort of your own home. It even reminds you how to do the exercises. Okay. That's it. Okay, so there you go. So there's a little bar here. I want you to, that's no dizziness, and that's the worst dizziness you've experienced. Okay. Just drag it up there. Yeah. Okay, Six. and then just input it in there. Input okay. There. What sort of results have you seen so far? Well, it's in prototype form at the moment. We know the exercises work, but we don't know what, how to deliver them best. We found that elderly people find it maybe a little bit complicated to use, but they do like the fact that it's in their pocket, that they can take it out, that it's reminding them to their exercises, and it's showing them how to do it properly. It was a difficult, it was a difficult period for me, but thankfully the technology was there to ease my mind and to aid me on my recovery back. Now at dawn to the balance centre and all, they had the simulator in which they put in the harness and the walls move and this, that, there was a lot going on. They were putting a um, blindfold on me and, and analysing my eyes within that, how they were moving in the dark, how they were, you know, I was going up on one foot, on one foot holding my balance. Touch wood now, I haven't had any symptoms in the last two weeks or so and I think that really did get me over the line and that it took the science and the technology to prove that to me. Research suggests that people who suffer from concussion are more likely to have a lower limb injury six to 12 months later. Kitman Labs are developing a system called Capture, which monitors movement parameters such as balance that might be affected by concussion. We have designed a system that uses infrared technology uh, to scan the athlete when they're moving through a range of different tasks. Movement was largely restricted to a lab-based setting before, which required a player to be markered up. It used to take maybe 40 minutes to marker them up. They would have to perform their movement assessment, and then the analysis would be done by professionals in the lab. And the, the experts in the field might get the results a week later. So what are the advantages of your system? Our system allows that information to be taken in, processed and fed back to the professional in real time so that they can visualise how that athlete is moving and make an informed decision about whether they're ready to return to play or any modifications that are required. So Jonathan, what we're going to do now is take you through a movement screen. It okay. starts off with a calibration position. So the instructions on screen should guide you through the movement. We predominantly look at dynamic movements, so stuff like an overhead squat, a single leg squat, movements that require the athlete to respond and use their neuromotor system to produce the movement. 
Once the data is submitted from the camera, we're looking at your right and left single leg squat. So we get an idea of how the knee is performing in different planes of motion, and they can easily eyeball where any asymmetries are taking place. And then on this movement quality tab here, we see the really interesting information. So this shows how you got into the movement, and how you get out of it. So we can see here that you're much more comfortable on your left side. The movement was much longer. You took longer to reach your peak flexion versus your right side. So that would indicate that you're much more comfortable on that leg. Wow, there's a lot of information here from such a simple movement. Yeah, exactly. The fact that the system is entirely portable and allows data to be recorded in real time makes it easy for any athlete, not only those who've suffered a concussion, to carry out ongoing assessment. What we want to do is to provide complex movement information in a really easy to assimilate way so coaches can use it to inform their decision making. What are my chances of making the first 15? Ah, uh, slim. <laughs>
I guess on the whole, Irish athletes have a, have a reputation for being clean and for, for being doping free. And the Irish sport um, system, the anti-doping system in Ireland, has a strong reputation and is recognised worldwide as one of the leaders in anti-doping. And on the, the, the combination of these things mean that you know, we've, we've been fairly successful in keeping a clean slate. In order to keep it that way, Una and her colleagues monitor athletes with regular testing. There are different ways in which we establish who to test and we decide who to test and we look at different um, risk factors. The status of the sport, the level of participation we've reached in the country and then the risk profile of the sport. So cycling and particularly the road cycling is very, very heavy demands in terms of endurance and therefore substances that are beneficial to endurance athletes will be abused in cycling and those kind of sports, things like cross country skiing. Then you've got the power sports where it's very clear that a huge increase in muscle mass is going to make you faster. We collect blood samples routinely and we look at the profile of those blood samples and we look and, and track. So Whereas we might not detect a substance, we might detect something unusual happening within their body. The impact of a drug might be showing up in their blood. The Irish samples are sent to a lab in Cologne, one of only 34 labs in the world that has authority to carry out such tests. Keeping a lid on doping is a continual game of cat and mouse between athletes and anti-doping enforcers. It's an ongoing thing. There's always going to be continued improvements in the science. There have been a lot of cases now, most recently as a result of the Beijing Olympics, where samples have been taken out of storage and new methods of detection have been applied. And therefore, these athletes are now being banned. So they thought they'd got away with it. The samples were put in storage. And when a better way of testing for something is, those who are suspicious in some way or other, then the samples can be taken back out again. For as long as athletes find new substances to abuse, then the scientists will be busy trying to find new methods of detection for those samples. With recent scandals about doping in sport dominating the headlines, it's good to know that Irish researchers are playing their part in keeping sports clean. For instance, researchers in the Limerick Institute of Technology are developing new ways to detect drug doping in greyhound racing, but for some truly weird drug doping. Let's go back to the 1904 Olympic men's marathon in St. Louis. It was a hellish race. Athletes collapsed from excessive heat, dust inhalation, being chased by wild dogs, or all three. The winner was Thomas Hicks, who was helped in a way that was not only performance enhancing, but almost performance ending. 10 miles from the finish, Hicks was spent, but his trainers wouldn't let him quit. Instead, they gave him what was for the time, but the common performance enhancing and perfectly legal drug, strychnine, the active ingredient in rat poison. This causes muscle spasms by interfering with the spinal cord nerves that control muscle contraction. At high doses, the lungs are overcome by cramping, leading to a gasping and excruciating death. This time the spasms were just enough to jolt Hicks back into running, and thankfully not enough to kill him, as he stumbled half dead across the finish line. This bizarre story about using drugs to push the human body beyond its limits serves as a reminder that sport should never be a matter of life or death. See you next time. Whether you're an elite athlete or an amateur player in any sport from rugby to golf, if you aren't careful, you can get injured as a result of poor technique. And now scientists in UL are using modern technology to study movement in detail and help improve performance. Their work in this field known as biomechanics could help to reduce injury and improve your golf swing, as Dr. Ian Kenny explains. Biomechanics is two elements. One is looking at how they perform and play better. And that's through correct technique. And secondly, trying to reduce injury. So that's prehabilitation. Again, looking at correct technique, how fast or slow people move, how strong they need to be. The research is, is looking at performance and injury prevention. We will position the golfer into a laboratory with multiple cameras around them. These are high-speed cameras with an infrared spectrum of light. We put markers on them, track the motion, 
and then through some analysis afterwards, we'll look to see how fast the hips might be moving, how fast the arms are moving. Elite players vary the way they hit the golf ball each time, which reduces their chances of injury. But the rest of us could use a little help. Uh, and something we also look at is the differentiation between how far the shoulders and the hips move, and that's called the X factor. Now, it's not something you see on Saturday night in television, but it's something that develops power for the golfer. There's a big difference between um, an elite golfer and maybe somebody who's non elite. And it's counterintuitive to what you might think. An elite golfer will have lots of variability in their motion. Um, so, different techniques each time they play. Um, whereas an non elite golfer, somebody who's not quite so good, will be quite rigid. So this variability in motion is really important by mechanics. Yeah, it is counterintuitive though, because mm. you expect it, like Rory McIlroy has a swing and he yeah. just does it all the time and that's why he's good. Yeah. But actually he varies it and that's why he doesn't get that's injured. Right. The most important question really is, can your science help me play golf? I hope so. <laughs> you have to be interested in it. Yeah. Will we give it a try? We will. See if you can get my swing up to scratch. We will. We'll go to the lab and try. Okay, great. Just Thanks. don't break any camera. Yeah. Ian put reflective markers on specific parts of my body. These markers enable infrared cameras and computers to track and monitor my every move. Whilst a high-speed camera on the ground measures the speed of my club and the speed of the ball. So you're basically going to make a stick figure of me? Yes. Uh, we don't want to track the muscles, we don't want to track how you look. It's only the skeleton. Have you ever analysed someone who's never swung a golf club before? Yes, lots. <laughs> lots. So you're okay. not the first. Okay. Elite golfer Andrew McCormick gave me a quick lesson. Okay, Turn your hips and your shoulders. So. And your shoulders. Yeah. This is the X factor that That's Ian is yeah. talking about. Absolutely. Do I have it? <laughs> it's like, no. No. Ah, that was rubbish. Don't record that. Don't record that one. But somehow I began to get the hang of it. Oh. Then Andrew had to go and show me up by demonstrating how it should be done. So Ian, if you were to compare Andrew's analysis versus my swing analysis, what would the differences be? You'll see some real obvious difference straight away. You'll see lots of uh, more shoulder turn and hip turn with Andrew. You'll see a delayed wrist release coming down into the swing. A little bit more stability. Your swing has uh, swayed a little bit from side to side. There's lots of variation from one shot to the next. But with a little bit of practice, a few more shots, you can see it starts to develop all the time. Eventually, this type of research should benefit everyone, not just elite golfers. Biomechanics is something that takes a little bit of time. There's a lot of number crunching, um, but helping to Hit some, let somebody hit a little bit more accurately down the middle of the fairway and be injury free, something everybody could do with. That's our 10 things to know about sports performance. Next week, we look at the science behind virtual reality. Ah, look at that disgusting goo. Murtha's investigation into the mental state of a Navy SEAL is put at risk by Riggs's connection to the suspect in all new Lethal Weapon. There's a double bill tomorrow night from 9.30 or catch up on episodes one and two on the RT player. Up next, Special Forces Ultimate Hell Week.